Our scripture today is Hebrews chapter 11. Um, And I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation. And I invite you to just listen to the words um, of the Bible. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. Through Through their faith, the people in days of old earned a good reputation. By faith we understand the entire universe was formed at God's command that what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. It was by faith that Abel brought a more acceptable offering to God than Cain did. Abel's Abel's offering gave evidence that he was a righteous man, and God showed his approval of his gifts. Although Abel is long dead, he still speaks to us by his example of faith. It was by faith that Enoch was taken up to heaven without dying. He disappeared because God took him. For before he was taken up, he was known as a person who pleased God. And it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. It was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God and warned him about the things who warned him about the things that had never happened before. By his faith, Noah condemned the rest of the world and he received the righteousness that comes by faith. It was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and go to another land that God would give him for his inheritance. He would without knowing where he was, he went without knowing where he was going. And even when he reached the land God promised him, he lived there by faith, for he was like a foreigner living in tents. And so did Isaac and Jacob, who inherited the same promise. Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations, a city designed and built by God. It was by faith that even Sarah was able to have a child. Though she was barren and was old, was too old, she believed that God would keep his promise. And so a whole nation came from this one man who was as good as dead, a nation with so many people that like the stars in the sky and the sands on the seashore, There is no way to count them. All these people died still believing what God had promised them. They did not receive what was promised, but they saw it all from a distance and welcomed it. They agreed that they were foreigners and nomads here on the earth. Obviously, people who say such things are looking forward to a country they can call their own. If they had longed for for the country they came from, they could have gone back. But they were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. That is why God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. It was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Abraham, who had received God's promises, was ready to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. Even though God had told him, Isaac is the the son through whom your descendants will be counted. Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back from the dead. It was by faith that Isaac promised blessings for the future to his sons Jacob and Esau. It was by faith that Jacob, when he was old and dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and bowed in worship as he leaned on his staff. It was by faith that Joseph, when he was about to die, said confidently that the people of Israel would leave Egypt. He even commanded them to take his bones with them when they left. It was by faith that Moses' parents hid him for three months when he was born. They saw that God had given them an unusual child, and they were not afraid to disobey the king's commands. It was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking ahead to his great reward. It was by faith that Moses left the land of Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He kept right on going because he kept his eyes on the one who was invisible. It was by faith that Moses commanded the people of Israel to keep the Passover 
and to sprinkle blood on the doorposts so that the angel of death would not kill their firstborn sons. It was by faith that the people of Israel went right through the Red Sea as though they were on dry ground, but when the Egyptians tried to follow, they were all drowned. It was by faith that the people of Israel marched around Jericho for seven days and the walls came crashing down. It was by faith that Rahab the prostitute was not destroyed with the people in her city who refused to obey God, for she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. How much more do I need to say? It would take too long to recount the stories of faith of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and all the prophets. By faith, these people overthrew kingdoms, ruled with justice, and received what God had promised them. They shut the mouths of lions, quenched the flames of fire, and escaped death by the edge of the sword. Their weakness was turned to strength. They became strong in battle and put whole armies to flight. Women received their loved ones back again from death. But others were tortured, refused to turn from God in order to be set free. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. Some were jeered at, and their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained in prisons. Some died by stoning. Some were sawed in half, and others were killed with the sword. Some went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. They were too good for this world, wandering over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. All these people earned a good reputation because of their faith, yet none of them received all that God had promised, for God had something better in mind, so that they would not reach perfection without us. Isn't the word of God powerful? Just on its own merits, rather the merits that God placed in his word by his spirit. Just a side point, it's an unusual length of scripture, and thank you, Eric, for reading it. Um, You notice that the title is Look Both Ways. Last night, my sister called me, and in the course of the conversation, she asked, what, what are you preaching about tomorrow? I think I'll tune in as I do sometimes. Hi, Jeanette. Just thought of that. And anyone else. But anyway, uh, so I told her that we were going to have the entire chapter, Hebrews 11, read in the worship service. And uh, she said, so what are you preaching about? Faith? Now, she's the one that after family worship, every time after we would read the passage, around the circle, my father would ask at the end, what did you learn? She would always say, have faith. (laughs) That's what Jeanette would say, have faith. It was the universal answer. And I told her, actually, not specifically. We're not talking specifically about faith today, even though we have just had read for us what's called the faith chapter. It contains the definition of faith. Um, But what I wanted from that passage is for us to experience vicariously the whole picture of the stories that are told there of people that trusted God and how they lived their lives in relationship to their hope and relationship to their present duties and callings and situations. The two focuses that they looked. And by the way, just as an example of what we experienced here, there's another way. We see, all the time called and we feel the tug to either look here or to look there either to look this way or to look that way. Some of you have bifocals and you have the choice, either to use your distance lens or to use your reading lens. You're all the time thinking about how to choose. And a lot of times with scriptures, we we make that choice. 
do I, do I just read or do I dive in and study deeply and really get the meat that's there? And I hope one of the things that you experienced as we listened to the entirety of Hebrews chapter 11 would not have been your experience in a gathering um, back when that was written. We might have sat together and listened to the whole letter. In through to you. There are things that come through to you. The example that I use, I've shared it with you before in my study of the scripture, is in order to be prepared to do the deep dive, the scuba diving, if I'm trying to understand the lake, I should probably water ski it first to see where things are in relationship to either, each other, to see the big picture in other metaphors, to see the forest and then examine the trees. Anyway, as we think about what we just experienced with Hebrews 11, I want you to think about things that came through. What did learn from the lives of those people? Just enter, not in detail, picture learned from their lives. Begin this message. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. And thank you for the example of people who have trusted you down through the centuries and even the millennia and the example that they have left us that we can learn about the life that you have called us to here and now. Please, by your spirit, speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. The thing that prompted me uh, to start thinking about this was, as I us as believers, as I thought about us as Seventh-day Adventists, I was thinking about the fact that just not that long ago, the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists met in session in St. Louis. You're aware, most of you, I'm sure, of what that means. Representatives from all over the world went there, delegates, and, and, and many attended virtually as well, to make decisions on behalf of our worldwide Seventh-day Adventist family. And I got to thinking, what does that mean for us here in Scott Valley? And as you've listened to the reports and perhaps watched some of the live streams, mind, what does that mean in regards to my life? These decisions they're making about who's elected the General Conference president, Remember him in our prayers and, and all of our brothers and sisters around the world. What does that mean for me to get up in the morning to live my life? What does that mean as we meet here on this Sabbath day? What does that mean at, uh, at uh, what, does, what does all that mean as I live in my neighborhood? Decisions were made about wording in the church manual. Where should my attention? Should I be focused on, on all these issues for the world church? Or should my focus be here? If you're around me long enough, you'll hear me um, say uh, sometimes, from time to time, whatever we do worldwide, and here's actually, I won't say all that, but what I say is all ministry is local. All ministry is local. All ministry happens between people who are in contact with each other immediately. Um, so should we be looking at the big picture? Should we be looking at the big big story of the three angels' messages going all over the world? I mean, this morning we tried, like everything, to watch a story from Africa. And instead we got to hear Hap read a wonderful story from Africa. And we ask ourselves, was that, just, was that just so that we could learn from the example of that young man and his faith and his decisions and the things that he went through? Or, in actuality, if you look in the context of the book, booklet that he read from, the purpose of that story was to get us to look at the world church and what God is doing around the world and how we can be part of that and help it. So should we be looking way out there, or should we be looking right here in our homes and our families in Scott Valley and our neighbors and 
And I'm sure that I'm, I'm going to, I wasn't thinking about Father's Day, but I'll give a nod to fathers right here and now. I'm sure that not your mother, but your father told you from time to time, look both ways. Look both ways before crossing the street, of course, was, was the context for that. But And so as regards to the worldwide work that we have a mission that is worldwide, we don't have to choose between, uh, between looking at the big picture and looking at what God has for us to do right here. We can look both ways. Um, my mother since I didn't get to share with you at Mother's Day, my, mother's, my mother always would say to us, when they tell you that you can't have your cake and eat it too, they're lying. That was my mother's take on look both ways. Um, the fact of the matter is, um, you can walk and chew gum, right? You can walk and chew gum. I want to shift the focus now away from that initial thought that made me think about this looking both ways and see how the principle applies in another way that relates to what we just listened to from Hebrews chapter 11. What did you notice about the people that were witnessing chapter 11? And where was their focus? It brings to mind a phrase that we use sometimes, uh, an aphorism saying. You've heard of someone being said about, they're so heavenly minded, earthly good. You've heard of that? Their head's in the clouds. They're always, they're always thinking about someday. You know, they're, they're religious. They're super spiritual, religious. But all they're thinking about is, they're thinking about spiritual issues, and maybe even literally they're thinking about heaven. But when it comes to what's happening in the world right in front of them, they're disconnected. They're, they're not helping. They're not working on things. They're not making things better. They're not solving problems. They're not doing the basic work that needs to be done to make sure things happen that need to happen for people's survival, for the church to work, you know, etc., etc. So heavenly minded that they're of no earthly good. I can tell you, as I listened to this entire chapter read on my phone to me, in the same translation, what hit me was that in fact, the people whose stories are told in this chapter were so heavenly minded that they were of more earthly good than they could have been otherwise. Look both ways. They were so heavenly minded that they were more earthly good they couldn't, than they could ever have been otherwise. The scripture Paul here writing tells us that because of the hope that they had, because of what they knew was coming, the promise that they believed in, that their faith was invested in, the promise that made it so that they could see things that didn't exist yet, the promise that made it so that, that they could hope in things that they just had evidence for. That, in fact, made it so that they, it changed the way they lived their lives on earth in the here and now. Some of the things that are talked about in, in Hebrews 11 are more short term. Some of, the, some of the examples of people that are given don't extend all the way to the second coming and to heaven and the new earth and all of these things that, that were being looked for. But, you know, we look, at, we look at Noah, for example. Noah was able to look both ways, wasn't he? There was a flood coming. God told him about the flood, and God told him not only about the flood, but that there was a way of rescue that he had designed for any 
who would believe the message and would take advantage of that method of rescue. So what did Noah do? Did Noah only preach for 120 years? Did he only tell the people there's a flood coming and God has designed a, a way for us to be saved and for the animals to be saved? And whoever will believe my story that I'm telling you that there is a way for you to be saved and then go to bed at night and get up the next day to preach yet again. Do. He built him archy, didn't he? He built him, but not just him, he built his looking forward to what God said was the rest of he would believe is actually what motivated him to do what was needed. So that at the time when that happened, there would be an archy, archy. For the animals to get into, and for any who would believe, which turned out to be only so that they could be saved. Because Noah looked both ways, would have come if Noah had not only looked forward to the prophecy and the promise, but also looked in the present what he needed to do while he was here waiting for that promise, for that reality come to existence. And we see the other examples, Noah looking forward to the promised land, to the redemption of Israel. We look at at all of the others that it says they, they, you know, Abraham, looked forward to a city whose builder and maker was God. So what did he do? Well, let's pack up the camels. Let's fold the tent. Let's get the food supplies that we need for the journey. Do you see what I'm saying? Well, I mean, Abram looked forward to what God promised him, and he looked down to do presently what God called him to do. Noah, I, Abram looked both ways. He looked forward to the promise, and he looked down to do what he needed to do in the present context. God called us to do the same thing. The people that Hebrews chapter eleven that gave their lives that gave their lives because they looked forward to that same city, builder and maker is God. They were looking forward, and in the present, they did the gospel work. And they were, and they paid the price for it. Yet, what was to come? And I love the way, I love the way the chapter ends, even though the book goes on. What does it say about those people and us that we share with them who also look both ways? People who look forward to what God has promised and our earthly good. What does it say? It says we together with him fulfillment of the promise, that which we have invested our lives in. in the teaching home, homestead about the danger of being reminded that you're, no, that you're no good at pulling Could you imagine someone who talks to you every day about how they're looking forward to the harvest? Oh, I can't can't wait for when I get those juicy red tomatoes. I can't wait for when I pluck just big bunches of sweet seedless grapes. I can't wait for the zucchini. It's looking forward to zucchinis, right? Can't wait for that zucchini. But you look outside and you don't even see the grounds dug up. 
you look outside and, you, and, in, and if there is the ground dug up and there's plants in there, you see stuff just growing all around them, overwhelming them. And yet you talk to the person, the gardener, and they're saying, oh, the string beans this year are going to be tender and just the right crunch. You eat them raw and the flavor when you cook them, you won't believe. That's so harvestly minded that you're no present good, isn't it? This is what we've seen in Hebrews chapter 11. This is what God is calling us. He's calling us not to choose, well, should I think about God's word all the time? Should I read Revelation 21 and 22 all the time over and over? again? Should I recite um, you know, John 14 1 through 3 all the time and, and, and think about that? Be so heavenly minded and as no, look both ways. You don't nearly think about heaven enough. You don't nearly let your heart be moved enough by the promise of Jesus soon coming, the resurrection of the, of the fountain of the waters of life. You, you don't think about that nearly enough. You don't focus nearly enough on the needs at hand of the people who need what Pastor Mike was talking about last, last week, who need you present with compassion, with empathy, helping them, being the friend that isn't necessarily paid to listen and to show the care and the comfort that people need. You are needed here now to work together with the local church family in reaching the people in this valley with the message of Jesus and of His coming and what He's doing for us. You are needed here and now because of the hope of Him. Oh, hope you are needed here and now. This yard who can't do it themselves. Call when someone wants to God's word and his message for this time and the promise and the hope that you yourself have. Look both ways. You don't think nearly, we don't think nearly enough about heaven because. If we did, we would even more more here and now to do the work that prepares for that great final harvest that Jesus calls us to. Think about this. Jesus wrote one chapter, Matthew 24, talking about the promises and the signs of the second coming of Jesus, of his second coming. He spent one chapter talking about that. He spent three chapters, Matthew 5, six, how to live here and now as members of his kingdom. If you think it's on Jesus and the Gospels or something, something along those lines, you might have encountered this whole this whole kingdom of heaven called the already and the not yet. Right? The already and the not yet. Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Jesus is talking about here's how you live as a member of the kingdom of God here and now. You're looking for the kingdom of God here and there and everywhere. He says the kingdom of God is among you. Matthew 5, 6, and 7 tells us how to live as members and purveyors and propagators and planters of the kingdom of God here and now, in this world now. Matthew 24 tells us about the coming of glory and power and about the signs that tell us about that that are part of how we work for others, the planting, the weeding, and all of the things that need to be done now before that harvest, for that harvest to be what God intends. We need to look 
both ways. You remember in Hebrews 12, following Hebrews chapter 11, what the writer tell us to do about where to look. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, and look at the examples. This is this is very simple, just compactly put in this call for us to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy in joy that was before him did what? He's looking there and doing this here. He's doing what's needed here. He endured this cross, despising the shame, looking unto Jesus. So, so looking unto Jesus, as I think about that, and, and I think about looking unto Jesus, looking back at the cross, as I look, think about looking unto Jesus, looking forward to seeing Him come in the clouds of glory to take all who believe and trust Him home with Him, I think about Matthew 25 when I think about looking unto Jesus too. And you remember that scene that Jesus tells us in metaphor to look forward to. You remember the sheep and the goats. Matthew chapter 25, he, he talks about how that um, he turned to, you know, for some reason the goats are the bad ones. Um, turns to the goats that I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was naked, you didn't clothe me. I was sick, I was in prison. You didn't visit me. And, and of course, you know, I like the King James phraseology. It just has a beauty to it. When saw we thee? You know, nobody talks like that, but it's when saw we thee naked and didn't clothe thee? You know, when saw we thee sick or in prison and we didn't visit you? And he said, inasmuch as you did not do to the least of these my brethren. You did not do it unto me. And then he turns to the sheep and he gives the exact opposite that. And he says, when I was naked, you clothed me and, and all of the above. And they say, when saw we thee naked and clothed me? And he said, inasmuch as you did it unto the least of these my brethren, you did it unto me. What is Jesus showing us there? We look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, but we also look at Jesus here and now as he presents himself to us in the person of people who need us now. Who need us to be of earthly good. Who need us to, to help them learn how to garden and take care of themselves. Who need us to visit them. Who need us to help them when they're sick. And who need us to help them know the Savior who wants them in his family so much that he came and gave his life for them and for all of us. The call that Jesus gives us today, the call that I'm asking all of us to take and to renew our commitment and to intensify our commitment is to look both ways. Let us look to Jesus wherever Jesus has shown up and will show up for us. Let us look to Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross. The one who knew no sin was made to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Let us look to Jesus there. Let us look to Jesus resurrecting from the grave, demonstrating that everything that he came to do and that he promised that he would do, he is able to do and exceedingly abundantly above all that that we could ask or think so that he can be glorified in his people here on earth. Let us look to Jesus in each other. Let us look to Jesus in the people around us who are in need, who need our help, who need to learn of him through us, who need our help physically with the needs of their lives right now, demonstrations in three dimensions and in human form of his love and what it is here and now, today. Let us look at Jesus. Let's look to Jesus ever living to intercede for us and carry on his work in the heavens 
so that the problem of sin that he has solved will be solved and never repeated. Let us look to Jesus in that manifestation of his love and mercy and good and justice and everything that is good about him, everything that is good about the Father, about the Holy Spirit. Let us look to Jesus there and let us look to Jesus coming in the clouds of glory. And let us make our choices in life about what we do now based on that. And of his desire that he doesn't continue to perish, but he wants all repentance and part in the fulfilling of that wish of our harvest-minded Savior. Can we embrace that? Can we look both ways? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. that you look on us and you see us both with our track records of sin and rebellion as sheep who have gone astray and you look and you see who you made us to be and you, you opened the way for us to be through Jesus. And so we come to you in faith now through him asking your forgiveness for where we have been short-sighted or where we've, we've, we've failed to embrace the purpose for which you have us here and now. Forgive us for where we have gotten caught up in the mundane things of the here and now and, and forgotten about the hope that you have before us that changes everything about the here and now. And please, we ask you by your spirit, through the power of your word, to change us from glory to glory into the likeness of Jesus, that we, looking forward to what you have in store for us, can do what you have here and now for us to do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's sing our closing.